Oh, my boobies are like. <laughs> Coming out to play. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I'm Horizontal in Venice, California. I'm Dr. Kat, and I'm lying here, Horizontal, with Lila. That sounds nice and breathy. I like it. Mm, baby, <laughs> all day. That's right. I'm a meditation guide, so when I lead my clients through meditation, sometimes they've said that I get really sexy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do they tell you that they use your voice for ASMR purposes? <gasps> they haven't, mm. but I bet they but do. But I bet they do. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they do, indeed. <laughs> Welcome into Horizontal, the podcast that takes you into my bed and lets your ears watch as I unzip intimate conversations. Thanks to listener Ghost Heart for that luscious description. I make private conversations public with the intention of dispelling shame, diminishing loneliness, and cultivating connection. I'm really glad you're here. This episode was recorded on my Horizontal Does America tour in November of 2017. I took to the road in a little blue car and drove solo all around the country with two intentions. One, to feel as free as I could possibly feel. And two, to lie down and record as many episodes with fascinating humans as I could manage. In this quickie episode, recorded right before she headed in to therapize some people in the morning, I lie down with the sex therapist, Dr. Kat Meyer. Dr. Kat is a sprightly, sensual whirligig, with big green eyes and big brown hair, and a slender and very bendable body. She's a yoga teacher, a creatrix, a playful creature, a dancer of her prayers, a licensed relationship therapist, and a Reiki practitioner. If you live in Beverly Hills, where Dr. Kat sees people in her private practice, she could be your sex therapist. Kat's own podcast, Eat, Play, Sex, which just kind of sounds like whipped cream in podcast form, doesn't it? It explores subjects in the very same wheelhouse as this one. On her Instagram, Sex Love Yoga, which I follow voraciously, and I suggest you do as well. She shares the writing she spins from thoughtfulness, self-inquiry, some gentle nudging, and a vision she holds for us all. To open the most profoundly to our deepest longing, pleasure, and confidence. Her posts are little gifts for us, and each serves as a reminder of her mantra, I choose myself powerfully. Find her on the interwebs at sexloveyoga.com and katmeyer, spelled C-A-T-M-E-Y-E-R, dot com. We first met at a birthday party in Ojai, a 40th birthday extravaganza that was more like a miniature festival than any birthday party I'd ever seen, complete with food trucks, a musical amphitheater carved of rocks like a miniature Sedona, an elaborate, sensual ritual invoking the energies of masculine and feminine to infuse the man we were celebrating, and a giant bathtub truck with a Dr. Bronner's foam experience like the one at Foam Against the Machine at Burning Man. The amount of glorious attention and effervescent love paid to this man made me burn with a heady potion of envy, admiration, and inspiration. Oh, God, I want people to come together over me in this way, I thought. I want to facilitate this experience for someone else. Inside the house by the pool, in a room made for cuddling and love, festooned with pillows and soft things, people were practicing acro yoga. Having taught for so many years and drifted away from the practice for so many more, I sometimes move away from people who are in the throes of it, the first flush, the ones who fly people at every opportunity, every park visit and ecstatic dance and house party. But this time I was drawn in, 
because it felt familiar, and the rest of it felt so unfamiliar. I offered a therapeutic flight to a friend of my friend, the one who brought me. His first. That looped me in as one of the acroyogis and built a bridge for them to talk with me. One of them was an acroyoga teacher as well, newly minted. When I told him about the podcast, he said, oh my God, there's someone here you have to meet. And he called Dr. Cat over. Six months later, we were lying on a shaggy rug in her living room, her pet bunny hiding out in the corner, California morning light insistent through the blinds, shaking off sleep and a little bit of crankiness and a little bit of misunderstanding, and recording this story together. We talk about threesomes and the right to change your mind, delayed emotional responses, how the point of sexual no return is an illusion, being satisfied before orgasm, seeking yeses and nos in the body as expansions and contractions, and how meditation and affirmations don't have to look like what we were taught that they look like. If you enjoy lying down with us, this is how you can make sure I continue to create independent, uncensored, and ad-free homemade radio. Become a patron of the Horizontal Arts. It's like a subscription service, in a way, crowdfunding for artistic patronage. You offer a monthly contribution, from $2 a month on up, and you get a level of special access to me and my work. You know that you're a direct catalyst for making the world a more intimate place. And I do a happy dance. And then I get back down to it. Patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. You can also just follow the link in my Instagram bio that reads Patron of the Horizontal Arts. It's right underneath a weekly dose of intimacy. I think you're going to want that too. You can sign up on the website. I'm just saying. I have big, big plans. Big dreams for what's next in the world of Horizontal. And you can help me happen it. And now, darling, come lie down with us and a little white bunny. So much hair. Oh, it happens all the time. Cat hair. Ha. Ah. <laughs> yes, it does. In fact, I have a lint roller in the car that I will be using in a moment. Mm. So, cat, will you tell me a story? Mm. I have stories for days. When you asked me to do this, I was like, oh my God, which one do I pick? <laughs> I want them all. <laughs> well, you can tell more than one. <laughs> yeah. Um, what came to my mind, though, and this story kept saying, pick me, pick me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this happened, this was years ago when I started to get interested in multiple partners. And not necessarily the poly world yet, because I was kind of tiptoeing into it. But I was seeing somebody named Wesley at the time. And we were evolving in this relationship. And I remember going to an event with him. And as the event was ending... I made the assumption that I was going to his house, right? And mm-hmm. going to sleep over Avi, <laughs> as was happening like multiple times a week. <laughs> right. And his assistant was there and she was hanging out with us, you know, it was super fun. She's super hot. And um, she was, she asked if she could crash at his house too. And I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Sounds fun. So we all went back to his house and we all, crawled into bed and snuggled in, right? It was super cute. And then, Mm -hmm. and he and I had never talked about, you know, having any sort of other partners together. We were exploring each other, right? But then you know that feeling when you're next to somebody and you feel the sexual energy Mm -hmm. start with, I could feel it. And I was like, 
Can I cuss? Can I curse in this? Of course. Oh my God, I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, what? I feel it. I feel it. And I was like, cat, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off inside you. <laughs> so I was trying to manage this whole sexual energy in myself. <laughs> and I was like turning the whole bed on. And then the next thing I knew, like I could feel feel movement in the bed you know how somebody starts moving in their Mm -hmm. hips and you're like and at that point I was like okay I guess this is (laughs) happening (laughs) and this was you know before I was actually good at communicating now I'm badass communicator I'm pretty good at if I may say so myself got some slips sometimes but at that point I was just like okay here it comes it's happening And I could feel her starting to move her hands across him and then across me. And the next thing I knew, I was just like, okay, if this is happening. So I just took off my clothes and like (laughs) dove right into it. But the thing of it is that I was so pissed off at him because nobody checked in with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I felt so pressured in that moment. And in the I remember my thoughts at the time and being like, Kat, you're this is cool. Like, this is awesome. You're getting into a threesome right now. Like, go you, you know. And at the same time, there was another voice that was saying, I'm so angry at him. Like, he didn't check in with me. He didn't ask if I was okay with this, you know, and this is happening around me. So when he would give me sexual attention or go down on me or, you know, play with me, I would not let him kiss me at all. Hmm. But then with her, I was making out with her. I was giving her pleasure. I made her orgasm. And yet I wouldn't let myself really enjoy the whole experience. Now watching her was really fun for me. It was so beautiful to watch her and her pleasure and her and her orgasm. And yet I stopped myself. And It was interesting in retrospect because it was like I was the resentment that I had for what was occurring. I didn't want him to get the pleasure of seeing me get off. Mm -hmm. Isn't that bizarre? No. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) But it's like, I don't give myself the flesh. I don't fully allow myself to have fun because I'm still holding the, I'm holding this resentment. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. And then he and I had, Wesley and I had this conversation the next day where I was, I brought up everything and, and, and it was primarily around, because I sit with emotions and I sit with jealousy and I sit with, you know, upset and everything. And, and I tuned into that and realized it was coming from a place of I don't know where he and I stand. So I didn't feel on solid foundation in order to invite another partner in. Yeah. You know, um, I have no problem with inviting other partners in and having threesomes or, you know, foursomes, whatever. It doesn't matter. Or my partner, you know, being with somebody else. But the the fact that I didn't know where we were. And in that moment, there was no check-in. And in that moment, there was no communication. It was just, this is happening. Jump on or jump off. And there was that fear of being perceived as a wet blanket or, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, you're not mature enough or, you know. We're going to have fun. Yeah. And you're ruining it. And he didn't take that well. And that was the other thing. He just saw it as, um, well, I, you know, we can't go further then. And it was a total disregard of my feelings. And in that moment, I realized, okay, this isn't my partner. Like, my partner wouldn't ever say that to me. I'm amazed that that didn't 
ruin my interest in that type of play. But it definitely taught me to um, look at why I'm not speaking up, why I'm not using my voice to create exactly what I want in a situation, sexual or relationship, and how easily it can be that pressure can cause us to be quiet. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is common, I think. I think a lot of people experience this where they are in situations and they just don't feel they can speak up for what they want or what they need. We have needs. Mm-hmm. And not to mention the fact that this was his assistant. Yeah, this was his assistant. Um, <laughs> hmm. Hmm, Wesley. Oh, Wesley. Come on. <laughs> uh, power differential, sex. Maybe she felt pressured. Oh, no, she jumped right on. She, uh, I noticed because I was watching, too, because I was hyper aware, right? Mm-hmm. And she was mm, crawled into bed naked, which isn't anything. I didn't care about that at the time. I was like, okay, cool. You know, like, we're chill. But it, I asked him afterward, and he said that they had been hooking up for a while. So that was another thing, I, I think. And there's no blame on her. I think that she, uh, because that was their dynamic, she probably felt that that was okay in that situation too. And it would have been if it was communicated, I think. But I think the other piece of this is that we never know what's happening inside other people until we ask, and sometimes Mm -hmm. not even then. Sometimes Mm -hmm. people can't even articulate even then. And she may have appeared to be fully on board and in her pleasure, Mm -hmm. but we don't actually know. How many times have women faked it? Mm -hmm. how many times in order to not be perceived as a wet blanket in order to be perceived as the fun carefree free love kind of person Mm -hmm. the thing that I've been talking with a lot of people about recently very inspired by Marsha B of Cuddle Party is the right to change your mind Mm -hmm. you were a yes as they say a yes it's I'm still kind of wrapping my head around whether I like that or not. But you were a yes to getting into bed and snuggling with them. Mm -hmm. Then other things started happening and you didn't want to change your mind. You're like, well, I'm already in. And I was talking Mm -hmm. with Pamela about this, that this idea of a point of no return that I've felt many times Mm -hmm. and actually had spelled out for me by So there's this Broadway actor, and why we don't name, you know, I'm not going to name him, and I feel annoyed because I'm sure he's done this to many, many, many other young women, and I'm concerned that I'm going to get blamed, Mm. so I'm not going to name him. So there's this Broadway actor who I met because I was in a show with a member of his family, and he came to the show And then as seemed to be his MO, although I didn't realize it until a little bit later and talked to somebody else, he found my email, I think through the contact list, because he was doing a little something for the show. Mm -hmm. And he emailed me and started a correspondence. And I was in my early 20s, very soon out of theater school, just a few years out of theater school. And... He invited me up to his apartment, you know, in Midtown. Mm. And I was living out in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And and I went up to his place and I think we started kissing and he started touching me. And I, I pulled back for a second and I said that I wasn't sure mm-hmm. that I wanted to. And he said, well, you're already here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard that one. I've heard that and one. And mm-hmm. so, <laughs> and so, that doesn't mean I can't say no or change my mind. And I did have sex with him. Yeah. And I didn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And he didn't reach out to me afterwards. And I have seen him a couple of times since. And there's never been an apology or a recognition that 
he coerced me. Yeah. He coerced me into having sex with him. Mm-hmm. When I even even found the voice to pause and say, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But I didn't quite have the confidence to say, I'm going home. The other thing about this is I'm broke. I'm in my early 20s. It is late. In and New I will York. have to, and it is in New York, and I will have to take two or three subways in order to get home super late when it's not necessarily the safest. Yeah. And I made many decisions to stay over at the apartments of many men and boys because I didn't have cab fare. Yeah. It's such a common story. And I've also been in that threesome situation that you described, not Mm -hmm. exactly the same, but in a situation where it's like, oh, we're all going to just sleep here in the bed. And then things start moving and hands start moving. And I, yeah, decided, well, all right, well, this is exciting. This is fun. I guess I'm on board with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we convince ourselves. We're like, oh, I am having fun. Oh, this is exciting. This mm-hmm. is new. This is novel. Like mm-hmm. everybody would want to be in this. I'm aroused, so therefore I want it. Therefore I want it. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've done that in many years. Yeah. No, me neither. And I hope that going forward, I also give myself permission to change my mind even if I'm in the middle of an act with someone, in the middle of a sexual act with someone, and it no longer feels good. Oh, yeah. I've told people in the middle of it and be like, I'm actually satisfied now. And they'll be like, you're satisfied? I'm like, yeah, I'm satisfied. That's enough. (laughs) I've had, I'm not even kidding, and I've had the most amazing responses back. You know, at first I'll, I'll get like, sometimes I'll get a bewildered look like you, you're satisfied. You haven't, you haven't come. You haven't, I'm like, no, I, that's, I feel internally that this is a good and to stop here. I'm like, oh, but is, okay. I'm satisfied the truth or is oh, that yeah. just a nice way to stop? Mm-mm, no, I was satisfied. Mm. I was good. I don't always have to have an orgasm to have an amazing experience. Sure. But I've really developed this internal yes system or no system. I'm constantly checking in and be like, does this still feel good? Like you just said, does this still feel good? Mm -hmm. Um, Or feel this um, satiated feeling. You know, like when you eat and you're at this point of satiated, yeah. That's good. That's good. Any more would be too much. So I do tune in with that. And communicating with partners now, it's like I'm very communicative with my partners about this. And when my body contracts or when it expands, that's my yes and no system. And when it contracts, I know that that's my edge or that's where you know something's being triggered or something's not feeling in alignment with me. And even if I don't know what it is exactly, I'll vocalize it and just let them witness it or be there with me in it. And where do you feel the contraction? A lot of times in my stomach, but I get it in my, in my uh, chest, more near the sternum part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Or I also get this drop into my stomach. Mm-hmm. It's almost like my stomach's falling out. I'll get that one too. And those are my three uh, contraction pieces. So I know there's something there, whether it's something doesn't feel right, something's not in alignment, Mm. or something from my past is being triggered. So something unprocessed from an earlier time is now being stimulated here. Mm. I want to listen more to the cues of my body. And it's easier when I'm solo It's easier when I'm driving alone, right? Sure. (laughs) But I have pain in my solar plexus Mm. that I call anxiety pain because that's what Mm. it feels like. But what it is, as you say, is a contraction. Yeah. A contraction of my solar plexus that feels not okay. 
mm-hmm. and then I I have a, a throat contraction mm-hmm. if something triggers me in such a way that I feel sad or yeah. some some kind of emotion comes up anger can also do it anger can constrict my throat as well some sure. sort of grief or disappointment in the moment or I've also experienced that stomach drop that Mm -hmm. you're talking about. Usually I have it when it's my, someone's going to break up with me feeling. Mm. (laughs) Oh shit, it's coming. (laughs) (laughs) It's there. (laughs) You know, the throat one I can resonate with. I, um, and I notice that the throat will contract when I'm something's being created that I don't, it's not how I want to see it created. So something's happening, something's unfolding, and it's not in alignment with me mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Now, I've recognized that using my voice helps to create exactly what I need and want and what's in alignment with me, but if that that's usually what it is. So if I get that similar feeling, i got to sit down and be like, okay, what is actually unfolding before me is is actually what I want. And you seem to have diminished the processing time in order to be able to say moment to moment, not that right now, I'd like something different. And I think maybe earlier in both of our 20s, it took us some days to process. Oh, yeah. I think it took me some days to become angry with him. Yes. Yes. I totally agree with you. We would disconnect or, um, I speaking for myself, I'd dissociate or disconnect from myself and just not feel. And then it would catch up to me for days later. I'd be angry and I wouldn't know why. And it was crazy because I didn't make that connection. But now because I regularly sit with myself and I regularly tune in, the timing is a lot faster. Now that isn't to say that there aren't times in which something unfolds and I don't say something in the moment. I always come back to it if I need to. You know, so there's nothing wrong that you're not too late mm. to come back to a person and say, "Hey, you know what? I actually wasn't okay with that and I didn't realize that in the moment, but now I'm able to I want to say it now." And I haven't had anybody respond negatively to that either, uh, mainly because I make sure not to blame but to own. Except for Wesley. <laughs> Those are, oh my God, Wesley. <laughs> Big X. Wesley, no. <laughs> Big X over the, over the Wesley. Yeah, yeah. Well, even him, I mean, we were able to talk about it. it just he wasn't able to hold my process, you know. I think he just defended well, instead. But it wasn't just your process. You were saying hey, (laughs) this is something that should be communicated about. Yeah. And you're taking him to task for not communicating. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Which is a scary thing to bring up those conversations. Yeah. But in the end, we have to remind, I have to remind myself that, you know, whatever response that person has has nothing to do with my value. And that's been a helpful mantra for me to keep speaking up Mm. and there's times where I will say I'm actually really nervous to tell you this right now and blah 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 (laughs) you know and tell them and sometimes even you know as I'm saying that mentally just being like it's not about you know it's okay like you're speaking your truth it's not about your value and then I got to shut that off so I can hear what they have to say. <laughs> but but it's, it's almost like this internal self-soothing. Because otherwise, you know, you're, sometimes my body will be like... Meh, 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 meh. <laughs> Do you think you've been able to diminish that processing time because you've spent so much time in meditation? Totally. Totally. Meditation and, and, and I don't necessarily mean meditating in perfect stillness, silence, and going om... But meditation as in um, tuning into my body, being aware of um, 
thoughts that come up, being Mm -hmm. giving myself space to sit with things. I have a morning practice that I do sit in meditation, and part of that is a you know silent tune in with my breath, and part of it is um, you know if there's something that did come up, I sit with that event and do like a almost like a layered. Uh, practice to see what the thoughts, the feelings, the body reactions, where that could have come from, and what I've developed, you know, what sort of belief I developed about myself as a result of it. So, yeah, lots of time with myself. <laughs> In a way, I feel like this cross country road trip is a big meditation oh, with myself. Babe, I bet. Because I don't listen to music, mm-hmm. I'm either in silence with myself. Mm. Or I'm listening to a book on tape or a podcast. Mm. Or I'm talking to someone. Yeah. And many hours I'm in silence with myself. Mm. And I don't, I'm not focusing on my breath. Mm-hmm. I'm allowing. Some years ago I realized that the meditation practices that require you to focus and label thinking as thinking and put it aside and focus on a single thing felt too rigid Mm -hmm. to bring me benefit Mm -hmm. because I am already perfectionistic and Mm -hmm. hard on myself and internally unkind. And so what I needed was a softer practice. And my friend Matthew Stillman brought to me this idea that I could sit and just expand. Was it him? Hmm. It was Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wesley. And just expand my awareness to encompass anything that entered. Hmm. So I allow the thoughts, I allow the train to go until it's spun out until it's journeyed its journey and then Mm. it will shift to something else or maybe I'll shift and then shift back but the conscious desire to be extra attentive to what is happening Mm -hmm. thoughts the road my body that Mm -hmm. feels like meditation to me totally and that is powerful for me Mm. Yeah, I think meditation comes in many different forms. And I think you're spot on that we get focused on this, you know, sitting in perfect silence and focusing on one thing. I think that there's movement meditations, yoga is, there's walking meditations, there's, you know, like I was saying, this layered meditation. Um, Mandala, sand mandala meditation. Yeah, yeah. And I think, what is your intention behind the practice? I think that can help to um, decipher which one resonates best with you. You know, with yoga, sometimes I just need to move energy through my body and tune into the way the body feels. And that's meditation. However, it's movement because that's what I need. I need to to get things unblocked in that moment mm. or to ground, to ground. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and then there's times where I need to figure out a specific belief or event, you know, that I contracted in. And that would be one where I would meditate on that single event. And then there's ones of mantras that are repeated words or statements. Those are ones to help me shift a programming or a thought. One of my favorites Mm -hmm. is I choose myself powerfully. Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was going to a meeting regularly for a year, and at the end we did affirmations. Mm Mm-hmm. And for a while I did, I deserve healthy, loving relationships. Mm. Oof, oof, yes. (laughs) And then 
in the last few months, I was doing, I am so fucking talented. Uh, uh, yes, queen. Yes. <laughs> and I used to think, oh, affirmations, that's too woo-woo. I'm not going to believe them. Mm. But what I found was speaking them in front of other humans. That's what cemented it for me. Humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Kat learned to speak her boundaries, intentions, and desires powerfully, the end. Happily ever after. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I didn't know if that was, that was the end. <laughs> you bet, babe. <laughs> that isn't without its hiccups all the times or me like, meh, meh, meh. But... <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, but I'm very pleased with how the process is, has evolved. Yeah, and choosing myself. Mm. Yes. That's changed my whole life. And that's what's horizontal. I send what I call missives to my email list once a week. It's like lobbing a thousand messages in a bottle out to sea. I share my writing. One of the most recent missives was about my abortion and the right to choose. I share resources from the episodes. I share saucy photos and other miscellaneous bits of interest and ephemera, like that time I was in Playboy, talking about dating outside of your political party in the era of Trump. To receive all this goodness directly in your inbox, sign up on horizontalwithlila.com and add lila at horizontalwithlila.com to your address book for good measure. We don't want it getting lost in some updates tab or something, do we? Indeed, no. No, we do not. Season two has been edited by Chad Michael Snavely. Check out his slew of podcasts on chadmichael.com. Shauna Shea drew my sensual cover art, and you can hire her through 99designs, and I suggest you do if you have the opportunity. And Alan Markley created my intro music, He's Plastic Cannons on Instagram. On next week's Horizontal, I lie down with Rye of Rye Poly Talks. He's a super entertainer, a clear-talking and thoughtful advocate for alternative relationships, kinky stuff, and destigmatizing the conversation around mental health. And the host of many, many a panel. His voice is like whiskey and a rec room with burgundy leather armchairs. You'll see. Until next time, dear ones, I wish you someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. It's been a pleasure getting horizontal for you. So as I've been driving, I've been singing because, you know, I'm a child of the 90s. I was born in the 80s, but I was, you know, like a a cognizant human in the 90s. I got you. Mm -hmm. California knows how to party. California knows how to party. In the city of LA. <laughs> you know what? As I was moving, as I was moving out Feel here, lucky. that was the year 2010. That was the year that Katy Perry came out with her song, California Girls. Then I don't know all the words to it, but I played the entire <laughs> drive from St. Louis to Missouri, to uh, LA. Oh. Yeah, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I was so excited at first. I was like, yeah, I'm a Cali girl. By the time I got to California, I was like, I fucking hate that song.